So aloha and good afternoon. Uh, I had the privilege of telling you about a project I've been involved with the last 15 years and representing a large group of people because that's what it took to get this done as in most of these cases. Uh, we call ourselves the West Hawaii Aquarium Project or WAP because we wanted to make a difference. And West Hawaii is the west coast of the Big Island of Hawaii. Uh, the main, main people that have been involved in this that aren't here, Bill Walsh is definitely the number one person this project been involved for about 20 years. Sarah Peck with the uh, Hawaii Sea Grant. The West Hawaii's Fishery Council, which I'll talk to you about, is a de dedicated group of volunteers which have been involved in co-management of this system, all volunteering on their time. Uh, Ivor Williams, as well as a lot of divers, mostly undergraduate divers trained by the University of Hawaii, and a whole host of other people, as well as all the people that supported this research. So essentially what our project is about is to balance different uses of reef fish in Hawaii. This was not really a project about sustainability, although it turned into one. And really we were trying to focus on conflicts around primarily this fish, the yellow tang. And it's kind of a, a proxy for fish in general, but this is harvested live by the aquarium fishery in Hawaii and represents about 80% of the catch. And so people use this fish in different ways. The community looked at it. There's a big dive tourism industry built around this and other fish, and there's a large live caught aquarium fishery that uses it as well. So our challenge was to, to balance that because there were conflicts. And the way we did that was by engaging a diverse group of people, trying to get everybody that was involved in this, first in education, then in co-management, and also in cooperative research, and doing that both with natural and social science. What we actually accomplished, which I'll tell you up front, is, is quite remarkable. We managed to replenish these fish and others in marine protected areas, which were established during the project. Uh, I think I can demonstrate that we've shown spillover of adult fish outside of MPAs to um, areas where they can be fished, uh, larval connectivity among populations within and outside of MPAs, uh, what we think is a, one of the few sustainable ornamental trades in the world, and we have reduced conflict among stakeholders. So first let me tell you how this started. This started by a conflict, and the conflict lasted for decades because the state really did not want to deal with it. And this is an article that I think summarizes it. You know, that the truth that really it almost turned out to a shootout on the beach is not too far from reality. This was a very heated conflict. There were lots of things happening, and it escalated to the point where um, it, was, it was fairly bad. So what happened was the keener community became engaged in this as an issue, and, and reef management in general. And I think if there's anything I've seen today, none of these problems are solved easily. It takes decades of work by a lot of dedicated people, and certainly this is no exception. Uh, it began early by having workshops on education around issues, not just aquarium fish, but other things. Uh, they tried to make informal agreements with fishermen and dive tour operators to sort that out. When that didn't work, they established, established a small set of marine protected areas. When that didn't work, eventually the nonprofit group, the Lost Fish Coalition, uh, came up with tried to ban collecting on the coast, but then eventually ended up working quite well to improve management. During this process, we established volunteer monitoring programs in the West Way, uh, worked with children in K-12 to get volunteer groups, also a monitoring program, and all of this really developed a lot of momentum and support for what eventually happened, which was led up legislative action in 1998, uh, which became what's known as Act 306. Act 306 was a very creative piece of legislation that essentially created the West Hawaii Regional Fishing, Fishery Management Area. The entire west coast of the Big Island was an area where we could have flexible management strategies that would give some um, community a say in how things were done, with three major mandates and a bunch of other ones which I won't have time to talk about. One of those was to designate at least 30 percent of areas as marine protected areas that ban aquarium fish collecting, not fishing, just aquarium fish collecting. Also that the community would be substantively involved in these decisions and co-management and that there would be an assessment of the efficiency of these networks. To do that, we created two groups, one of which was WAP which is most of what I'm going to talk about today, but an also extremely important group, the West Hawaii Fishery Council, which was, a, again, a stakeholder group designed to help um, co-manage the fishery with the state. 
So initially, the, the West Hawaii Fishery Council, which included aquarium collectors, regular fishermen, uh, community members, dive tour operators, as well as 40% as of the group was native Hawaiians from different regions, basically came together with initial goal of where to put the marine protected areas. So again, large of this was conflict, so they're trying to figure out where to put these so there would not be conflict between these two groups. And so in addition to helping establish a marine protected area network, it also helped reduce conflict among these groups. Uh, later next year, there was a, a public meeting about this. A thousand people attended one of the largest meetings in Hawaii ever for a natural resource issue, and 93% of the people supported it, which is pretty unique if you've been to MPA meetings. Um, later that year, yes, yeah, usually 93% the other way, um, they, they, they did propose and the governor did sign off on nine marine protected areas, which are up and down the west coast of the Big Island. Uh, collectively closing 35% of the coastline to marine aquarium collecting. Uh, we didn't know anything about the life history of these species or habitat. These were just kind of spaced out and again, largely trying to separate the conflict. What we did then was establish a monitoring program. So we didn't really know how to design these things, but we studied them very intensely and, and learned. And so this was a cooperative program, again, with a lot of people, a lot of divers, a lot of time. The University of Hawaii program, Quest, was used as a platform to train primarily undergraduates, but some graduate students to do the work. Uh, we've been doing this for 10 years now. We selected 23 study sites that included areas that were still open, these new marine protected areas and places that have been closed for over 10 years and counted fish, and this is still going on. We also do reef surveys, but the primary focus is on aquarium fish. So what have we found? Well, after 10 years of data, we have successfully replenished the primary fish, the yellow tang. Here's the density of fish over time. We had one year of baseline before they were closed, and you can get an idea of the density there. Um, as we see, within three years, marine protected areas increased these stocks, and after five years, they would increase to 71%, or 72% relative to before. Uh, we also have control areas we compare these to, as well as open areas. These areas are actually doing better than the, the long-term control areas that were closed prior to these. The open areas are also fairly stable. Um, there are other aquarium fish that are increasing as well, one at least that is significant. So, but generally, again, this is 80% of the fishery, so this is really what we we're trying to strive for. In addition to this, uh, we've also demonstrated that these MPAs actually work, as a lot of people talk about. Kind of the, as we know, the holy grail of marine protected areas is spillover and seeding versus connectivity. Uh, Ivor Williams and Bill Walsh showed that, if you, you know, the idea that if you have a marine protected area, that builds up in biomass, you get spillover to other areas. In a recent paper, uh, we presented some data which shows that the density of adult yellow tangs within marine protected areas is fairly high, and within a roughly half of a kilometer or so from those areas, you do see an, an increase in density relative to areas further away where there's lots of fishing. So we think spillover is happening there. We've also uh, demonstrated in a recent manuscript by uh, Mark Christie and o Mark Hickson at Oregon State University, uh, connectivity using a unique genetic method, being able to actually connect adult yellow tangs to new recruits. And we've seen adults that are connected both here and here, as well as between here and here, showing that larval fish are moving from both within MPAs to areas outside and from outside areas into MPAs. So there is also connectivity and seeding within this network. And finally, we've also seen that the fishery has actually improved after the establishment of marine protected areas. When they were established in the year 2000, even though it declined initially, they have increased and it's the best harvest that's ever had. It also has attracted larger numbers of fishermen, and the catch per unit effort appears to be fairly stable. And in addition to that, a survey conducted by Todd Stevenson of veteran collectors that have been there for the entire period of time the marine protected area network was established have shown that um, the socioeconomic status of them has largely improved for the most part. For after the establishment of marine protected areas, they're actually doing better. And although conflict still does exist, it actually seems to have improved overall relative to uh, beforehand. So really, the secrets of getting all this done to me were, were really two major things. One was engaging both the community and the legislature. You really need both bottom-up and top-down to get it done, and that was, was key. 
Also, having both strong natural science that so we actually study this and feed that back to the community and so that they learn. And there's actually support now for an MPA network for fishing, and we we'll hope that that'll be the next step. Um, to learn more about the project, go to the Hawaii Coral Reef Network. Thank you.